So uh, my name is uh, James Osborne. I'm the uh, Knowledge Extension Specialist down at Oregon State and an Associate Professor in the Food Science Department. And it's uh, my pleasure today uh, to uh, moderate and also speak in a session around Britannomyces and Britannomyces spoilage of wine. And so this is a topic that uh, probably not new to you to some degree, but uh, I think we've got a lot of uh, good material here that might provide a little bit of background, but also some uh, kind of insights into some new research that's been uh, undertaken in this area, and hopefully give you guys some additional tools to kind of combat the spoilage yeast uh, in your winery. So uh, how we're going to do this session is um, my uh, the first speaker for today is uh, Dr. Charles Edwards. And so Charlie uh, is a professor up at Washington State University in the uh, School of Food Science. Uh, he also was my major professor during my PhD up in Was uh, Washington State University. So, uh, you know, short two credits. yeah, apparently. <laughs> Does this count for extra credit? Uh, and so Charlie, Charlie's been working in the area of wine microbiology for a, for a long time, uh, specifically around um, problematic um, fermentation, stuck fermentations, yeast nutrition. Uh, wine spoilage bacteria as well as Britannomyces. So he's got a, a wide range of kind of background and he's going to come and talk to us today a bit more about Britannomyces and some of the work that uh, his lab has been involved in recently. So with that I'm going to hand it over to Charlie and we'll get started. Wow. I've had the privilege of speaking here uh, two or three times over the, over the years. This is the biggest crowd I can remember. This is fantastic, guys. Very, very positive. I'm, this is just great. Okay. Like a lot of my talks, I thought I'd throw in a story for you. Once upon a time, I was really young. I was untenured. And back in 1991, our industry was doing a transformation. We were going from much more of an emphasis on white wine production to red wine production. And as a young professor, I didn't have gray hair, I was thin, I was good looking back then. That was humor. <laughs> um, the industry and working with the academics decided to have a short course that involved red wine making, because we were making this transformation much more to reds. And we had a great privilege. It was an incredible experience, folks. We had a winemaker, actually the director of winemaking, from this winery you may or may not have heard of, Chateau Margaux. Have you ever heard of that one? The guy was incredible. And literally, uh, I've seen hundreds of talks in my life. I've given hundreds of talks. Couldn't come close to what this guy could do. He did not use PowerPoint. We didn't have computers back then. We had slides. Didn't use anything audiovisual, but he told stories. And it was absolutely riveting what he was able to do and share with our industry. And one of the things he talked about, surprise, surprise, was the Bordeaux barnyard. Now, this fellow had an incredible ability, ability to speak. And one of the things he could do was turn around a symposium on its head and he flipped it around at one point, and he started to ask questions of the audience. And one of those questions was, and this is 1991, one of those questions was whether or not we had Britannomyces in wines from Washington. You could have heard a pin drop on a carpet. Back then, honestly, Britannomyces was like, talking about your personal issues with sexually transmitted diseases. I mean, it was known as the gonorrhea of the wine business. You didn't talk about it. But my co-author of the book Wine Microbiology, wonderful human being, Ken Fogelsein, he said it best. He said back then we knew most about Britannomyces, not by the science, but by conversations that occurred in the corner of conventions. That winemakers would pull on my shirt and pull me into a corner and let's have a conversation so we can learn more about Brett. Look where we are now. We're having a symposium about this organism. 
I consider that to be a very positive thing. Because we've gone from denial that we cannot talk about it to now let's get it out on the table so that we can talk about it and find ideas and find solutions and really understand the bug much more. That is positive. Now I have to give you just a caveat, um, uh, a couple of things. I am hard of hearing and so when you ask a question you may have to repeat it a couple of times. Um, there are certain frequencies I cannot hear very well anymore as I have aged. Um, one of them, my wife speaks at that particular frequency. Um, you know, and it was interesting because she would be talking and I would walk away and I found out that wasn't good on a marriage. Uh, I didn't fully understand that. Uh, the second thing though is that James and I did have, um, and you are two credits short by the way, uh, so we got to talk about that later. Um, but we did have a number of emails going back and forth related to how long I was going to speak. I wanted to speak for four hours. You know, I'm a classic academic kind of guy, and I like to talk. But we've cut it down to about 40, 45 minutes, somewhere in that ballpark. I am going to skip over a lot of the current research that we're doing right now. So maybe we'll have a, a Q&A session later on after, after James's talk where we can bring up some of those issues. Or maybe I get the great fortune of being invited back sometime. Okay, you. Which way do I point? There we go. So what have we learned about controlling Brett? And we started this work about 10 years ago. To give you an idea how emotional it is, I sent out a letter to about a third of the industry at the time just asking for wine samples that may have been contaminated with Brett. What was interesting and fascinating, I got two phone calls from two winemakers that let's just say they were animated. They were upset. How dare I make the accusation that their wines had Brett? They were angry. So we're going to talk about Brett today, so please don't take it personal. Oops, wrong way. We're going to talk about the impact of SO2. What does SO2 really do to the yeast? We're going to talk about interactions that you can use. The interactions between, say, ethanol and cellar temperature that can be used to help uh, slow down its growth. We'll talk about filtration as to what types of filtration requirements are necessary. That one's important, folks. I'm working with a wine we right now that uh, the winemaker literally believed that if the wine was at, oh, 15.5 to 16% ethanol, nothing would grow in it. Absolutely nothing. So therefore did not believe in filtration. And even though one of their red wines was spritzy at the time of bottling, they bottled it anyway. And lo and behold, two to three months later, a whole bevy of complaints came in. Quite honestly, I think they're going to lose the winery. We'll talk a little bit about growth in oak, because certainly this is where we find Brett. We find it in the cellar, in red wines, in the under aging. We're also going to talk a little bit about must nutrition and how potentially must nutrition can impact things later on during alcoholic. So first off, SO2. Hopefully, uh, all of you are using SO2 to at least to some extent to help keep Brett at bay. But there's been an interesting concept, and it has been incredibly um, controversial. There are those who initially really did not believe it, but as more science comes out from different parts of the world, including our laboratory, this VBNC thing, what that stands for is viable but not culturable. What it means and what it translates to is that at least using traditional means of, of, of cultivation, using synthetic media, the organism can't be cultivated. But in the wine, it's still alive. You did not kill it. So the yeast is still alive, but it will not grow on media for whatever reason. If valid, that means that the yeast could be undetected. And that's a negative thing, because a lot of folks do rely upon culturing of microorganisms to see if it's there or not. So how to detect it? What could you do? You can certainly measure some form of metabolic activity, and there's, all, there's different biochemical approaches to things. Perhaps the most controversial are the qPCR methods, whether those are picking up VBNC or not. We decided to go a different route, 
And we actually use fluorescence microscopy. Fluorescence microscopy. And basically what you're doing is that you're adding different chemicals that will react with the yeast cell differently. If you add one chemical and the yeast cell is able to act upon that chemical and split it apart, all of a sudden the whole cell will fluoresce bright green. If you have another cell that's dead and that's got holes in it, this chemical can enter into the cell and stain certain portions. So literally, it gives you a colorometric way of looking at the status of a yeast culture. And here's Brett with those two stains present. Notice you have clearly some active cells there, and you also have some dead cells there. Taking it one more step, you can actually count those cells so you can get an idea of how many viable and how many dead and compare that against how many culturable counts you actually have. And this is where we start to understand a little bit more about what SO2 does. Here we've got a plot. I'm going to try to use the pointer. Here we've got population. It's both in culturable as well as just cells. If it's cells, you're using fluorescence microscopy. If it's CFUs, you're using culture. We plotted that against molecular SO2 over time. And here is one of the strains that we found in the state of Washington. Let's hit it hard. We like stressing yeast. We think that's positive. So let's hit it with almost 0.9 milligram per liter of molecular. That should kill everything, right? Well, if you do the cultural populations, you see this. So here we've got a very healthy population of Britannomyces that's growing. It's reached over a million cells per milliliter. I hope and pray that you never, ever see that in your wineries. But at that point, we hit that culture with 0.9, almost 0.9 milligram per liter molecular. Look what happens to the CFUs per mil. They disappear. You would think the organism died, right? Sadly, wrong. There are the dead yeast cells, and as expected, you're seeing a rise in the population of dead yeast cells. At the same time, you're seeing a decline in the viable cells. So these are ones that are still viable as, as measured using fluorescence microscopy. And look at right in here. So you've got a situation where you cannot detect those with culture methods, but you can with fluorescence microscopy. That tells us that SO2 doesn't necessarily kill the yeast cell, but it certainly slows down its growth and its metabolism. And there's the decrease over time of molecular. So Brett is definitely resistant to SO2. So that's one thing that we have learned. How about is there a relationship between ethanol and temperature that we can rely upon? Certainly, a lot of wineries are making higher percent uh, alcohol wines. Could we use that coupled to cellar temperature as a means to help keep things at bay? One of the things to understand is that it's not a linear relationship between uh, ethanol and temperature as related to growth. Notice that there's going to be minimums as well as uh, optimas as well as high amounts, but it's not a linear situation. It really does depend upon the microorganism, but also the concentrations and temperatures that you're looking at. So we decided to design a series of experiments to look at this particular phenomenon. 12% ethanol. 12% ethanol. You can see I've got the different temperatures here, starting from high down to low. I've got it in both Fahrenheit as well as Celsius. And you can see early on that, boy, Brett sure seemed to grow pretty well at 21 Celsius, which is 70 Fahrenheit. As you decrease the temperature, notice that it starts to struggle, but it does eventually reach very high populations. It takes some time. It takes some time, and that's frankly one of the challenges with the work, is that Brett is a slow-growing organism, and you'll see in some slides coming up um, that literally we're, we're incubating things for almost a year just to make sure of some stuff. 
All right, let's raise the ethanol concentration. Let's go up to 13. We can see more of a differentiation with temperature here, and even at the low temperature, boy, Brett is starting to struggle. And at least after 100 days, it did not yet get up to 10 to the 6th, but it certainly is growing a lot slower. So there appears to be a relationship here between these two variables. Oh, don't do that. There's 14%. Notice that at 21C, um, Brett disappeared and did not reappear uh, after 100 days. But again, you're getting more of a differentiation here the lower the temperature um, you go. 15 is where a lot of red wines are being made now. Uh, that's where you're seeing a lot of differentiation. And so here, you've got death at, or at least dying off at, at 12 Celsius, but boy, Brett is really struggling, uh, even at the warmer temperatures. If you get up to 16%, Brett doesn't like it. Moral of the story, make 16% alcohol wines. Thank you very much. <laughs> that didn't go over well, did it? Okay. But let, let's look at one of the volatiles that's produced. Furethylphenol is a well-known metabolite. It is used to get an idea as to the Brett infection in a wine. Let's see what it does. This is at 21 Celsius, as shown here. These are two different strains that are, were isolated from two different Washington wines. And you can see right there, 15 seems to be an interesting marker. Uh, at least between these two strains. Now, I simplified the data. I did not want to bore the heck out of you showing plot after plot of four ethylphenol. That would, it would, it would drive you nuts, like it drives me nuts. But I, I kind of simplified it so that none's being made, a heck of a lot's being made, and somewhere in between's being made. But right here, you can see strain F3 did not produce any at 15% alcohol, whereas strain 1A did, therefore, Diversity. This particular species is incredibly diverse. If you have it in your winery, your strain is going to behave radically different. Guaranteed. And that's one of the things we saw all throughout uh, our Brett studies on just about everything. 18, we'll lower the temperature a little bit. You can see that yet again, at that 15% um, ethanol, that we're not seeing anything with F3, but we are with I1A. Let's keep lowering the temperature. 15 degrees Celsius. Wow. We're not getting any 4-ethylphenol at 15% ethanol for either of the strains. If we lower it to 12, we see difference here in that we are seeing some at 12% uh, at ethanol, but none at the higher levels. So there is definitely a relationship between these two parameters that you might be able to utilize in your own situation to help keep Brett at bay. How about filtration? One of the interesting aspects or offshoots of that whole viable but not culturable concept, if Brett is going through it when you hit it with SO2, one of the aspects to it, or beliefs anyway, is that cell size shrinks. Ooh, that would be bad for filtration, wouldn't it? That'd be really bad. There was some evidence presented by some French enologists that this was happening, but I have not directly seen this. But we decided to set up a filtration trial looking at that. So we had red wines with either zero or half milligram per liter of molecular SO2. Well, being a scientist, we got to have triplicate replicates, right? We got to be able to replicate this. But what is a treatment rep? The treatment rep is the filter cartridge, because that's what's changing. And that's why you don't see too many of these studies out there. You, you would not believe the number of filtration cartridges we went through to be able to collect these data for you to see today. This was an expensive trial. 
because we had to use so many of these things. So on top of the different uh, cartridges and different porosities and such, we had samples without SO2 and samples with SO2. And we had to incubate these over 200 days because we had to make sure. And that's, some of the, that, that's one of the philosophies that our lab group adopted. Because this yeast grows so slow, we wanted to make sure that we were getting rid of it. And that's why these long incubations, and all I can say is, thank God for grad students. Right? <laughs> okay. We start off with 1.2 micron absolute. And this is strain B1B. So again, you know, one of the goals in our research is to be able to really spoil a wine. And you would not necessarily see this, or hopefully not see it, in, a, in an industrial setting. But you can see here we got really healthy populations. We ran it through a 1.2 absolute. And lo and behold, absolutely no, no, vi no viability at all after 212 days of incubation. Conclusion? You can probably get away with 1.2 micron. Or can you? Remember what I said about diversity of yeast. And that's why you've got to be very careful. If you've got Brett in your particular situation, your Brett is not going to be my Brett. You've got to be very careful with it. In this particular case, for this strain, yes. 1.2 micron will get rid of it. Um, but we changed strains and went to F3, did the same exact experiment. Here we got the three firm, uh, filtration reps yet again. Went through 1.2 micron, and it looked fine for, oh, 30 days or so, but then all of a sudden we started to see growth. Two of the three replicates started to have some growth of Brett, meaning that a few cells did get through, meaning that there was some diversity of size. We did not, the good news is we did not see any influence of SO2 on this. So SO2 did not seem to shift the size of these things. With F3, uh, we decided to try a tighter porosity and went down to a, a 0.8 micron. And here, we incubated out to 270 days and did not see any growth, did not come back. So current recommendation from our laboratory is a 0.8 micron absolute should be enough to get rid of most Brett, as far as we're aware. Oak barrel work. This has been an incredible project. I'll try to give you an, an overview as to what we've been up to. We've been using both French and American oaks, uh, small barrels at times, 16 liter, but we also have some from industry, 225 liter. And what we're really after is a number of different things. Hi. One of the concepts to keep in mind is, is something called D-value. Now, the overall purpose of this work is try to find a heat regime to be able to eradicate Brett from a barrel. Folks, chemicals don't work that way, not with oak. And so we had to figure out much more about how far the yeast actually penetrated into the wood. It does. Because that's, and that's why chemicals don't work, because chemicals don't penetrate nearly as far. But there's a concept called D-value, and you've not been exposed to it. It really is an important one. It's the time for a 90% reduction at a very specific temperature, at 55 Celsius, and we're going to use that as a benchmark. We'll use that as our benchmark. It's about one minute. So it's one minute to reduce the population by 90% or one log. What we did, and I don't know if you can see it, um, my dad's a professional woodworker. So a few of the skills rubbed off on me, and we do have a really nice bandsaw in my shop. And so what we did was to take apart a barrel, and you can see those little marks right there? We took it apart into very specific links, and then we marked it so that we can use a bandsaw to cut the various layers like so. And don't worry, I still have all my digits. But we used a, what they call a resaw blade, which is a really wide blade. And if you've ever played with a bandsaw, they're a lot of fun. But we took apart these staves. 
So we had at least four cross sections of a barrel. So here you have the inside of the barrel going outward. You have four different pieces of that at different depths. We then took those pieces and put those into sterile wine. So here we've got a really large surface area, and what we're trying to do is recover any brett that would be present in those barrels. Does it make sense? Oh, this is cool. Sorry, I get really excited with the research. Okay, this is recovery of brett from the industry barrels. The industry barrels were um, uh, three years old. These were three-year-old barrels. And we have the French and the American. Notice the staves right at the top of the barrel. They may or may not be in direct contact with that wine, but there is no doubt that you see Brett in those staves. Now that's going to be important for any heat treatment because it means whatever you do to the bottom of the barrel, you're also going to have to do to the top of the barrel. You're going to have to reach certain temperatures for certain periods of time. The inter one of the other aspects to this is that notice that the populations are obviously very low, but over time they start to roar back. Over and over again, the French was the winner. It was very clear to us that there was a higher population in French barrels, and it didn't matter where our source was, it didn't matter the toasting level or anything else. French oak seemed to support a higher population of Brett. It was also deeper within the barrel. That's probably due to the, the porosity of, uh, of French oak. Top staves, bottom staves. Now again, these are three-year-old barrels. Here you've, got the, here you've got the populations in that layer that is closest to the wine. So that's four millimeters into the barrel. If you go another four millimeters past that, you can see clearly there's a lower population here, but it's still there. Translated, this yeast is penetrating. It is penetrating some significant depths within that barrel. So what we've done is to, again, cut these staves. I got to use a lot of time in my wood shop, which is always very positive. But we mounted these things onto a custom-made stainless steel plate, and there's the plate right there. It's got room for 16 pieces of stave, which were randomly assigned. We then put thermocouples at different depths within those staves. We place them over a kettle uh, to generate steam and then record the temperature. These blocks were then periodically removed. We took them into the wood shop and sawed them into those little layers and then put those into sterile wine to see if we can determine yeast recovery. Isn't that exciting? Thank you very much. Oh, no, no, I gotta keep going. All right, here's what we saw. So we go from, here's American oak and here's French oak. Uh, here is the zero depth, and here's as you go farther away from the inside of that barrel. Now, if we put in place our magic line for the D value, the D value, that's at 55 degrees, you can see that even at the 25 millimeter depth, it's taking, what, about eight minutes to get up to that temperature, something like that? French took a little shorter time approximately seven minutes, but overall there, weren't much, there wasn't much of a difference in terms of heat penetration. So we didn't see a tremendous shift here in terms of how long it took to get up to certain temperatures. All right, this is messy and I apologize, but I, I, I really worked hard to figure out how to present these data to you. And these are literally hot off the press these are those smaller oak barrels, and, and we, we decided to use really small oak barrels uh, that had the same stave thickness, if anything, for cost, because they were far cheaper than the, than the large barrels. But what we did was to put a, a sterile filtered wine into those barrels, we inoculate very specific strains of brett and let them grow for months. We then took apart the barrels. Okay, here we've got population basically against heating time. And so the steam treatment is along the bottom. So we have zero, three, six, nine, and 12 minutes. And that's total time. 
Within, the, each of those, within each of these brackets, you see the times here from uh, 1 to 60 days. That's the incubation for that particular piece of oak in a sterile wine. So we wanted to incubate up to 60 days, again, to make sure that we weren't missing anything. Now, in the case of, these, uh, of, case of American oak, clearly the yeast only penetrated to the 4 millimeter depth. It was not present in that, in that next layer, the five to nine millimeter. But as you increase the amount of steaming, you can see that the population are going down. Out here at six, uh, six minutes, it takes 30 days for a recoverable population to show itself. So that tells you that the population most definitely is getting down. At least with these American barrels, uh, nine minutes, we're seeing absolutely no recovery of the yeast whatsoever. So let's change until the oak. It will change the oak and we'll go to French. Now, with, with, the, with these identical barrels, except that these are made out of oak uh, from France as opposed to American oak, what we're seeing, again, is much more penetration of the yeast. So here we have zero to four, the zero to four layer, the five to nine layer. The zero to four is the red. And the, and the five to nine is the, um, uh, is the blue. Now again, notice that yes, that there's, a lot of, there's a lot of breadth there. As you increase the time of, of the steam treatment, the inside layer is certainly getting a reduction faster. But it has not penetrated into that second layer such that way out here at nine minutes, you're still having a small population that's really buried in that stave. And, it take, and, th and at least according to these results, it's going to take at least 12 minutes of steaming before that's reduced. So now we have figured out, hey, the type of oak plays a role here, but also the penetration of that yeast as to how far it's penetrated into the oak. Okay, must nutrition. What's the impact of must nutrition? I don't know about you, but I've heard this story for years that if you add way too much must nutrition to ensure a good alcoholic ferment, you're leaving nutrients beside, in that wine that could therefore be later used by things like Britannomyces or Lactobacillus or any number of spoilage bugs. So if more nitrogen is added to the grape must, is there going to be more nitrogen in the resultant wine? And does that higher nitrogen encourage subsequent infections? In other words, the question that we were really asking was how much nitrogen does Britannomyces really need to grow? Can we maybe find a way to control its growth by, by watching how much nutrient we are adding? How are we on time? Okay. Now, for these studies, we decided to use a synthetic grape must. Basically, what it is is a grape must that takes, the, takes the, the preparer at least three or four days to make. It has all the nutrients that would be present in a normal grape must, but it allows us to make some changes. So we actually did a factorial experiment where we had two different levels of yeast nitrogen, yeast assemblable nitrogen present in the must, and then we had three different levels of sugar. This is one of those studies that morphs. One of those studies that morphs, we actually started off looking at um, the impact of how much nitrogen on Saccharomyces. So in other words, if you have higher levels of sugar, do you actually need more levels of nitrogen? But we thought about it, and it's like, hey, we have all these great wines, let's add some bread and see what happens. And really, really interesting. If you look at the wine analysis alone, the alpha amino nitrogen, no surprise, nor should there be, that under low nitrogen situations in the grape must, the wine will have low nitrogen. Under higher, the wine will have higher. And that's the same as true for ammonia. So, the, so the, the, there's no, nothing surprise there. <clears throat> For the purposes of this presentation, I'm going to define if, you've got, if, we, if we use 230 gram per liter of sugar, that will be a low ethanol, medium, and high, um, just to help us to understand our results. Okay, you with me? 
We did two yeast strains, two Saccharomyces yeast strains, ECA5 and Uvafirm228, and this is the growth of one of the strains of Brett, E1. Under conditions of either low or high yan initially in the grape must, and with low ethanol, you can see the growth of this yeast was, man, I don't see many differences, do you? Okay, let's raise the ethanol. So this would be a higher sugar ferment. Um, but again, oh, okay, there's a longer lag phase. It does get up to these really high populations, which hopefully you won't see. Uh, but no difference between yan in terms of low versus high. At the high ethanol, now Saccharomyces does have a, you know, it doesn't like to grow above 15, 15 and half percent uh, ethanol. And in both these cases, uh, the yeast started to die off, and it didn't recover, uh, at least with this yeast strain, at 30 days. This one always had some recovery. So clearly there was something antagonistic between that Saccharomyces and Brett. But I don't see any difference between those, do you? So what's it say to you? It said to us, it made us really wonder as to how much nitrogen uh, Brett really needed. And the answer in technical terms would be called diddly divided by squat. <laughs> Without any added nitrogen in a synthetic wine, look at the growth of, of, of Britannomyces. It certainly didn't decrease in population, and in fact it actually increased in population. But even with a very low amount of six milligram per liter of yan, look what happened to the growth. It jumps up to 10 to the seventh. So folks, Brett doesn't need much. It does not need much in the way of nitrogen. So it's kind of a myth that adding extra nitrogen at, at the must is gonna somehow affect Brett later on, because Brett just doesn't need much. I'm gonna change directions now a little bit we okay on time? Okay. And I want to give you something that I hope will work for you. I've had a great pleasure of working with a lot of wineries, and one of the wineries I worked with uh, was down in California. They make a red wine. They were having incredible problems with volatile acidity, but they could never trace the issue. And so they brought me down because uh, we did a lot of work with lactobacillus um, and volatile acidity. Now, please understand my background. Uh, I was raised in California. <clears throat> Please don't hold it against me. <clears throat> I'm a beeve, though. <laughs> Graduated in 1918. When was that? 1982, I think. Yeah. One of my. Uh, uh, she and I went to school together many years ago. Um, anyway, I was working with this winery and. I, I was raised in California. We did have a 30-acre vineyard, which, which is why I, lear I learned about the horrors of pruning in that dreadful, horrible California winter. Um, but my, my father also uh, later on bought a, a vegetable cannery. And as boss's son, you either lay on a shovel or you actually are doing some work. And given my Victorian father, I was doing the latter. But I got to do a lot of experimentation and understanding about how processing worked. And I understood the need of taking a flashlight out and, and looking for stuff. So I'm going to give you some ideas related to microbe management along those lines. We could never figure out what the problem was in VA with that California winery. However, I gave them these secrets. They're not secrets, but hopefully you can use them. They made changes. VAs went down. I got a bottle of wine at Christmas. This is win-win. I mean, it was a very positive situation. What winemakers really should be doing is minimizing the risk of spoilage. And this goes true for Britannomyces, hands down. But it also goes true for a lot of other microbes, Acetobacter, Lactobacillus, and the works. The idea is multiple hurdles. Multiple hurdles. So between an initial infection and spoilage, your job as winemakers, in my view, is that you want to put up as many barriers as you possibly can to that spoilage. Another winery I'm working with, literally, they believed, 
And the winemaker believed that, you know, if the wine's at 15 and a half, 16% alcohol, nothing will grow, and therefore had no other barriers in place. And what a surprise. They had that massive infection. Five minutes. Oh, five hours. Okay, I, I got five more hours. This is positive. I like this. Can I come back? This is really fun. Okay, hurdles. What are these? Anything you can do to stop the growth of microorganism. It, avoiding uh, importing unfiltered wine. That seems so simple. But the number of people that I've run across that have bought wine from a really good friend of theirs, a really good ex-friend of theirs, because there was a low population of Britannomyces in it, filter the wine before it comes in. Don't buy used barrels. Folks, you cannot sanitize wood. Not going to happen. And our work has shown that. It just isn't going to happen. Using combinations of SO2, ethanol, low temperature are very, very positive things. Filtration, 0.8 micron absolute. Certainly having a cleaning and sanitizing program, which is so very crucial as well. So your job, and I, I think that this is, to me, this is where craft or art meets the science. Your job is to put in as many hurdles as, you, as are reasonable for your situation. Too few hurdles, you're going to have a risk of spoilage. Hands down, folks. But you've got to be careful because too many hurdles, the, all of a sudden the expense is much higher than the actual benefit that you get. But that's, again, that's where the craft, that's where the art comes in. Keep in mind there are hurdle interactions that exist, say with, SO, say with ethanol and temperature. We've also shown it for SO2 and temperature. And there's a three-way interaction between them. So there's all these interactions that you can rely upon to help keep this guy at bay. So references, um, we did have a wonderful book uh, come out. It was a lot of fun to uh, have a lot of translators. It's written in six different languages. It has all the pictures of microorganisms that are present in it. Why Microbiology? This is the one that Ken Fuglesein and I uh, wrote together. A one, uh, really a fun experience. Uh, I guess some folks liked it as well because it did win the best uh, enology work back in 2007. And a quick story on this. Uh, I love the French. I really do. The literally... Literally, the day that, that Ken and I were going to fly to Paris, can you imagine a weekend with your spouse in Paris to accept an award? Man, we bought the tickets, and my wife and I were just going, oh, this is going to be great, because our son was still living at home at that time, and we were leaving him behind. <laughs> um, the French decided to have a transit strike. And you know where Charles de Gaulle Airport is, and there, nothing was moving between de Gaulle and the city. On top of that, there was not one, but two World Cup matches that particular day. We didn't go. Uh, we also have an extension book out, um, and all these websites will be available on the, um, on the um, um, internet on the, when they post the, the presentation. Oh, I've had so much more fun. You know, this list gets longer and longer, uh, and I really, really do appreciate the invitation. It's been too many years, but I'm just flabbergasted as how big you have gotten. I'm also flabbergasted at the hospitality. Now, I'm going to end the seminar with something that I've never done in my life, and I've given a lot of talks, but we, we got to tell you something that's not necessarily positive. I'm going to choke up. I'm sorry. I learned just last week something that's not very good. Um, some of you know Ken Fuglesang. He has been an instrumental person, has written tons and tons of books, and really has helped the university. Uh, he is in the hospital, and it's, it's terminal. So if you know uh, Ken, please send him a note. Please send him your love. I had to write a letter last week, which was very difficult for me. But Ken is just a wonderful, wonderful teacher, and I will never, ever forget his inputs. I know he's resting comfortably, comfortably right now. So anyway, thank you very much. And I dedicate the seminar to him because he is the one that brought Britannomyces to the forefront in my view. So thank you very much.
Thanks, Charlie. So um, just a reminder, we're going to uh, have time at the end of the session for questions. So make sure you've written down any questions you have for Charlie. Um, and then we'll have a, a good, hopefully, 10 minutes at the end there or into the lunch break if you want to keep talking about Brett at the, uh, after the, the end of my talk. I take Visa or MasterCard. <laughs> or bottles of wine, apparently. American Express, just so we're, we're clear. So um, what I'm going to talk about in my, uh, my presentation is kind of um, a couple of new research areas that our lab has been involved in in probably about the last five years. And they kind of piggyback on a, on a little bit of uh, work that Charlie has been involved in. Um, after I did graduate many years ago, we've continued a collaborative relationship with research, and you'll see that through this. Um, we're working around Britannomyces and, and wine lactic acid bacteria in particular. So we've heard um, a lot about some of the strategies, key strategies to preventing uh, Britannomyces spoilage in wine. And obviously the best approach is to prevent infection, to minimize the risk, uh, and to prevent growth of the organism. But um, we were also looking at other ways, other strategies, thinking about other hurdles, if you like, that you could place in front of Brett to prevent spoilage issues so that if you did get an infection or even a low-level low infection in your winery, are there other things that you could be doing, other hurdles that you could be putting in place? And one of the things that we were interested in looking at was the amount of, of precursor compound that's in the, uh, in the grapes or in the wine that Brett can then use to produce volatile phenols. So um, if you get a Britannomyces infection, uh, how much volatile phenols is Brett going to produce and how is that related to the amount of substrate that's in the wine. So that's kind of where, uh, where this particular study went. So just a, a little rehash uh, on the chemistry of this to understand uh, why we went kind of looking in this direction. Uh, so Charlie talked about the production of 4 phenol, that volatile phenol compound that smells like Band-Aids, barnyard kind of smell. That's kind of the predominant spoilage issue in wines. And volatile phenols are produced by Britannomyces uh, in a kind of this two-step process. So in grapes uh, and in your wine, you'll have this compound here called chimeric acid. Uh, there's other uh, hydroxycinamic acids as well, furalic and caffeic, that Brett will produce other volatile phenols from, 4-ethyl-guaiacol and 4-ethyl-catechol. So in your wine, you're going to have chimeric acid. It's just a natural part of the grape, and that's going to, in red grapes in particular, but also whites, that'll be transferred into the wine. So Britannomyces will take this chimeric acid, and there's this two-step process converting it to the vinyl phenol form, and then through to the 4-ethyl phenol, and that's the highly volatile form that we're concerned about. <laughs> However, there's also um, other sources of chimeric acid in your grapes and in your wine. And so while we have this, we call chimeric acid or free chimeric acid, uh, Chimeric acid can also be bound to uh, a number of other compounds, and in particular, tartaric acid. So in grapes, uh, a, a large majority of chimeric acid is actually bound to tartaric acid, and we call that cutaric acid. So here's chimeric binding up to tartaric, and we have cutaric acid. So we have to consider, if we're looking at kind of this pool of precursor compounds, we have to consider the free chimeric acid and then what we'll call the bound chimeric acid, where this tartaric acid is bound to it. And so that's kind of the area that, that we're interested in exploring. Because what can happen during the winemaking process and through wine aging is that cutaric acid uh, can, the tartaric acid can be cleaved off of there and free up more cumeric acid. So potentially, this cutaric acid needs to also be considered as a potential pool of precursor in your wine, not just the cumeric acid, which we typically think of um, being the problem. So when we're looking at this, we were looking at cutaric acid as being a potential kind of additional pool of precursor for volatile phenols. These compounds can be impacted by a number of different things. Uh, the levels of chimeric and cutaric are impacted by viticulture practices, by varietals. So certain um, varietals have different amounts of chimeric acid or different amounts of free and bound, and there's some information out there about that. We also know in the winery we can affect uh, how much of these compounds there are, um, particularly with uh, enological enzymes, um, some of the early um, uh, early products had some site activities, uh, in particular we call cinnamol esterase site activities where the enzyme, there's an enzyme present that could cleave that off and free up the chimeric acids. 
Most enzyme um, now uh, are chimer uh, uh, synamyl esterase negative. They screen and do a good job of preventing that because we know that uh, we don't want to be adding to the amount of chimeric acid uh, in your wine or juice. So enzymes were in early, but they're really not uh, um, uh, as much of an issue now. We know Britannomyces can degrade that free chimeric acid. We didn't know much about the bound and we really didn't know much about other wine bacteria that might be in the wine. So that's kind of the, the road we went down um, to have a look at these different uh, uh, microorganisms and to see whether they might impact the amount of uh, hydroxycinamic acids in the wine. So first step was looking at Britannomyces, and this work was um, a collaborative work with uh, Charlie's lab headed up that uh, we were um, part of, uh, looking at a large number of Britannomyces strains and looking to see whether Britannomyces can utilize the free and the bound form. Because right at the start, if Brett doesn't care, if it's Qataric or Chimeric, if it's just going to utilize it anyway, then there's not really any need to consider those as two separate things. It's basically combine them all together and that's what Brett can use. So the first step was just to determine can Brett actually do this? Um, because otherwise, you know, maybe we don't need to go any further. Well, what, what was found in the study of the 19 Brett strains that were tested was that none of them could degrade that bound form. So you have that free chimeric acid, Brett can convert that to volatile phenols, but if that chimeric acid was bound to tartaric acid, which often is the majority in, the, in juice and wine, then Brett couldn't get at that. And so you have this um, bound chimeric acid sitting there that Brett can't access, but potentially could be a source of chimeric acid if other microorganisms could act on it. So the next organism on the hit list we looked at uh, was Pediococcus, and I know other people have looked at Pediococcus as well as Lactobacillus' ability to do this, kind of uh, on a small scale. And uh, there again we found that while um, some Pediococcus strains can degrade the free chimeric acid, uh, none of them could degrade the bound chimeric acid. So again, uh, Britannomyces couldn't touch it and Pediococcus couldn't touch it. So we still had this bound cataric acid sitting there in the wine. Um, and so the final step was to look at uh, some Enococcus strains. And so that's what we did. So we set up a study um, where we made Pinot Noir wine. Um, we just used a standard practice. We pad filtered it, we sterile filtered it so that we had Pinot Noir that was, um, that had gone through alcoholic fermentation but had not gone through malolactic fermentation and then had been sterile filtered. We then had a control that we did not inoculate for ML and then we inoculated with three different ML strains um, Pinot Noir. After the completion of malolactic fermentation, we re-sterile filtered that wine and then we inoculated with Britannomyces uh, to see uh, if, um, firstly, if there was any difference in Brett growth, but then also if there are any differences in the hydroxycinamic acids um, due to the malolactic fermentation. So what did we find? So here we have a table. In the box here is the concentration of cutaric, that's the bound compound, and chimeric acid, the free chimeric acid. And you can see in this particular Pinot Noir that there's a large amount of cutaric acid and a small amount of chimeric acid. So most, in this case, most of the chimeric acid was bound to tartaric. However, after malolactic fermentation, we saw some changes in the concentrations of these compounds. So in the control, we didn't see any difference in alpha, we didn't see any difference in VP41, we didn't see any difference, but we saw one ML strain where we saw com some conversion of the uh, bound form to the free film. So there was this um, degradation or hydrolysis of the tartaric acid, and it changed the amount of free chimeric acid that was now in the wine. So in these wines now, at the end of Malo, you have different concentrations of the two forms of the, vo of the volatile phenol precursor. So what did that mean if Britannomyces uh, grew in the wine? So we inoculated these wines with Brett, and as expected, because there was more precursor compound in one of the wines, we got more volatile phenols produced. So Brett grew well in all of these wines, but the amount of fluorethyl phenol that was produced was related to how much chimeric acid was in those wines to start with. So for the control in alpha and VP41, they basically had the same amount of free chimeric acid, and we got the same amount of fluorethyl phenol and fluorethyl glycol being produced by Brett. But in this wine where we had, if we look back, we had over six grams of chimeric versus around one gram. We had correspondingly much higher amounts of volatile phenol because 
there's more of the precursor in that wine now, so if Pretanomyces grows in that wine, all of a sudden we have more of the volatile phenol. So we've done this with other strains as well, and looking at that, um, what was interesting was even in the control wine, when we get, and we had Brett growth up above, 10, above a million, almost 10 million cells, we still only had low levels of 4 phenol on these wines because of how much chimeric acid was originally in that wine. In other situations, and other circumstances, you're going to have more chimeric acid in different varietals, things like that, and so these levels might be higher. But if you're just looking at how some microorganisms might affect how much of the precursor compound in, is in there, then we saw that with, with the smell lactic fermentation. So some take-home kind of points from, from that study. Firstly, Enococcus itself does not cause the spoilage or any, any uh, production of volatile phenols. Enococcus does not produce volatile phenols or cause spoilage. And if you get a Britannomyces infection in your wine, whether or not you've done malolactic fermentation or not, you're still going to get volatile phenols being produced. But what we saw was in the case of one strain that it increased the amount of precursor compound in that wine so that therefore if you did have Britannomyces infection, you may get higher volatile phenols produced. So important to note that. So recommendation to, particularly if you're making wine, red wines, barrel-aged red wines, more susceptible to Britannomyces, to look at your ML strains as far as um, using strains that can't degrade this bound form of, of, uh, of um, chimeric acid. So that you're kind of, again, setting up another way to kind of minimize the risk. If you do have Britannomyces growth in your wine, you, you can minimize how much of the volatile phenols may be produced. Manufacturers now are starting to screen strains, and you might see some manufacturers uh, noting whether there are some enamel, esterase positive or negative strains. So it's something to talk with your uh, ML suppliers about if that's something uh, of interest. I think the other thing that we're just kind of starting to, to look into is, okay, what about uh, spontaneous malolactic fermentation? So if you're doing it without inoculating a strain, are you increasing the risk there? And, you know, the answer is, we don't know because we don't know what strains are doing your ML. And so in some circumstances, no problem, but in others we don't know um, how widespread this trait is amongst ML bacteria. Um, we've got hold of a few strains that uh, were not commercial strains, and one of the six had this property as well. Um, we've found this property in a few other strains, so it's not one and, and no other organism. So it's something to consider uh, if you're doing non-inoculated MLs, you're having issues, things like that. If you're inoculating with a strain, a high dose of a strain that you know doesn't have this property, then you might be, uh, be able to, again, add another hurdle into the, into the stream. When we were doing this work, one thing that, again, talking about kind of you start somewhere and you end up somewhere else often with your research, one thing we noted um, was sometimes when we're doing these experiments, we put the wine through malolactic fermentation. If we added Brett on top of that wine fairly soon after the completion of malolactic fermentation, sometimes we had a lot of trouble getting Britannomyces to grow. If there was kind of a lengthened period of time between the end of malolactic fermentation and when we inoculated those wines, Britannomyces seemed to be able to grow better. It was kind of a case in this case of the graduate student not inoculating it, forgetting about inoculating and coming back a month or two later and, oh, I've got to get Brett in there. And we, just when we saw that this difference, that grew fine in that case, but not if we inoculated directly afterwards. So this is a case where that happened. Um, here's Britannomyces growing in the wine just by itself. And here is if we inoculated Brett into a wine that had just gone through malolactic fermentation. There's still a lot of enococcus cells in that wine. We didn't remove them. And we had trouble getting Brett to grow in that wine. So it kind of piqued our interest as to what might be going on there. Is there anything really happening? Was that just a coincidence? And uh, we, we did a little bit of look, uh, research into the literature, found a, um, a paper by uh, Vincent Gobeau, 2009, who had showed that wines that had undergone malolactic fermentation, they had lower amounts of volatile phenol being produced if Britannomyces infected them. So it kind of piqued our interest that there might be something to that and to explore it further. So one thing we were interested in is if there is some sort of inhibition going on there, some sort of relationship, what might be happening? So we, we designed a couple of experiments to kind of get an idea of what this mechanism might be. Um, is it production of an inhibitory compound? Does enococcus 
produce something into the wine that Britannomyces doesn't like, and until that compound is either broken down or settles out, Britannomyces doesn't come back. Is it removal of nutrients by Enococcus? Is there some, the growth of Enococcus removing nutrients from the wine, and then it takes a while until that's um, leashed back into the wine for Britannomyces to grow? Um, or was it just due to the presence of a large amount of Enococcus at the end of malolactic fermentation. Putting Brett into a situation where there's a lot of Enococcus around, um, was that sufficient enough just for Britannomyces to not want to grow? So the first experiment we did was we took wine, we put it through malolactic fermentation, we used multiple strains, I'm just showing you one particular example. And then at the end of malolactic fermentation, we sterile filtered half of the wine and left the other half unsterile filtered. So basically we were removing Enococcus cells from the system. So we had wine where there was Enococcus cells present and then wine we would remove them by uh, filtration. So you can see here we inoculated in all cases. Uh, we saw this drop uh, up until about 20 days or so. Uh, we started to see growth of Britannomyces. So here's the control in green. And so after about 20 odd days we started to see growth um, and then in the wine that we'd removed the Enococcus by sterile filtration, we saw growth in that wine as well. But up to and out to about 70 days, we didn't see growth um, if Enococcus was still present in the wine, if we hadn't sterile filtered it out. So that kind of gave us some clues that maybe it's not due to production of an inhibitory compound. We used a, a particular membrane to sterile, fil uh, to sterile filter that's very low um, binding, so as far as what it might remove from the wine. Um, also removal of nutrients. Uh, that didn't seem to be the driving factor there because if it grows in wine that was sterile filtered, we're not adding nutrients back into the system by doing that. Um, so nutrients didn't seem to be the answer. Instead, it seemed like the presence of the bacteria itself uh, needed to be in there for, the, for us to see this inhibition. So the next piece of the puzzle, and the last thing we're going to finish on was we did an experiment to see whether we needed live enococcus cells or dead enococcus cells in the system. Was it just sufficient to have uh, enococcus cells floating around whether they were alive or dead? So we took a wine, we put it through malolactic fermentation. At the end of malo, um, we split it up and we, what we did was we, we treated it with high pressure. So in the food science department, we have this big high pressure unit, which is a, a really good way to uh, kill organisms without uh, really altering the food or the liquid that they're in. So we're able to take that wine and we're able to kill the enococcus cells in there. And then we're able to have wine where we had the same level of live enococcus cells. So we could really compare, uh, is it the presence of live enococcus cells or just live or dead enococcus cells that's giving us this reaction. So the first thing we did is see if Brett was going to grow in this wine anyway. And so this is the control, so no malolactic fermentation. We just uh, put Britannomyces in and, and we saw that if we high pressure treated the wine or we didn't, it didn't affect the growth of Britannomyces. So we weren't doing something to the wine by high pressure treating it that would then make it inhospitable for Brett in the first place. So that's our control. When we inoculated Brett into wine where we hadn't high pressure treated, so there was still this live population, over a million cells of Enococcus cells, uh, we saw this decrease in Britannomyces growth and then it slowly kind of gradually came back up after about 50 days. However, if we high pressure treated the wine and killed those enococcus, we saw a much quicker recovery. So here's the red line here. We see this little initial drop and then bam, Britannomyces grows just fine and reaches the same peak populations as we saw in the control. So it did seem to be that the presence of live enococcus cells in the system was, was kind of the necessary piece of the puzzle um, that was causing this, this decrease in Britannomyces growth um, for a long period of time. So in these two studies, um, you're kind of, again, adding kind of more information and more tools to our toolbox, I think, and our understanding of, of Brett. Obviously, the best strategy is preventing Brett growth in the first place and minimizing growth. Um, so taking advantage of, of all of those hurdles that we've heard about, good sanitation practices, particularly barrel sanitation, SO2, pH, temperature, ethanol, all of how those things work together. But also understanding the role that malolactic fermentation can play in that. So utilizing enococcus strains that, uh, that don't increase the amount of precursor compound. This new kind of area that we're going into, I think we're really just at the, the forefront of it, looking at um, 
the protection that malolactic fermentation may give, uh, particularly kind of in that period of time when malolactic fermentation is finished, you haven't got back to getting SO2 into those wines. This is kind of giving you maybe an extra added protection there for that limited period of time. It's certainly not a replacement for anything, but it's again one of those additional hurdles that you can put in place there to increase your chances of minimizing Britannomyces growth, minimizing spoilage. Uh, if malolactic fermentation is something you're doing anyway, something maybe we can utilize and harness better. So we're currently looking at, in all of this work, we've really been looking at one Britannomyces strain. We've started now to look at whether we see the same effect across a, a wider group of Britannomyces strains. As we heard from Charlie, there's a lot of strain variation within Britannomyces, so we want to know if we see the same reaction or, or not. Um, we've done quite a lot, a number of different Malo strains, and they've seemed to behave differently too, so we're kind of excited where this work might go and kind of how we might be able to give recommendations on utilizing malolactic fermentation as kind of another piece of this pie um, to kind of prevent and minimize Britannomyces spoilage in wine. All right, well, um, with that, I've got a few acknowledgements. Um, certainly the Oregon Wine Symposium for their support and for the, the chance to present my work here. Many collaborators, graduate students, undergraduate students, uh, my mentor Charlie Edwards here, uh, funding from the OWRI as well as funding from the Northwest Center for Small Fruits. I think we've got a few minutes for questions, so if you do have questions, I think there's an active mic somewhere that might be passed around, otherwise, yes, here, and uh, Charlie and I will, will be here for as long as necessary to answer your, answer your questions. Thank you. Hi, James. Uh, so on the, I like the live dead experiment was really interesting. I don't know anything about the density of Enococcus. Are they, are they colloidal or do they settle out? And so the question is, did you do something to make sure that they were equally suspended compared to the ones that were naturally motile? Did you do a shaker table or? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, no, we just, we, we um, high pressure treated them or not and then put Britannomyces on. So you may have got more settling out of the dead versus the live cell. Yeah, that's a good, good point. Hi, my question is about the viable and not culturable situation. Um, Two-part question. One, is there a set of conditions where these yeasts become culturable? after a period of being non-viable? And secondly, yeah. do they create 4EP, 4EG? You know, are they an issue? No. Okay. <laughs> Good question. Um, uh, the answer literally is yes and no. Um, you talked about choosing your ML inoculation. I understand it's problematic to say use this brand or don't use that brand, but is there any sort of uh, way to look up what which ones work better? Or? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I would talk to, again, I, the, the major manufacturers of the bacteria are starting are looking at this as a, an additional kind of thing along with, you know, high or low diacetyl or, you know, another thing that to consider. So the, the information is out there for a number of, of, uh, of strains now, for a number of brands. So I would talk to the email manufacturers about uh, whether they know that about their strains. Can you talk about other treatments when it comes to oak barrels, about steam and ozone and maybe negative ions? I mean, other, uh, can everyone hear me if I use my lecture voice? Oh, that's positive. What was the question again, please? Other treatments for, for, um, for Brett? Yeah. yeah, especially, you know, in oak barrels, what would you use to uh, sanitize oak barrels if steam or ozone would work, for instance? What I've seen and what we have, what we have seen is that ozone is effective uh, in, in terms of reducing populations about three to four logs, but no further than that. It will not sterilize wood. It cannot penetrate. In fact, uh, in one of the uh, studies uh, involving some of the industry barrels, we noticed that when we did a zero on, on what was the population distribution within a stave, it was interesting because inside the barrel and that little, that, that initial part had a lower population than towards the center of the barrel. And we wondered, well, what, how could that happen? Uh, the long and short, the history of that barrel was it was ozoned. 
And so the ozone had, had penetrated just a little bit and gotten the population down, but it couldn't go any further than that. Um, we have we worked, we, we have worked uh, with Scott Labs and some others on Kytosin. Kytosin is effective. It is a way, it is an option to help remove some of the brett. Um, Steam, um, right now, uh, at least with our data, we're, we're, it does depend upon the oak, obviously, but we're, we're talking probably 12 minutes to be able to get up to the temperature necessary. Uh, and that's the key. It, it, it all goes back to temperature. But you don't have Brett in, in Oregon wines, right? Okay, that's good. Other questions? go to a particular depth and do they oh I'm sorry and and were the viable but not platable actually found in the depths or was that platable uh, yeah we have not looked at viable but not culturable in the depths in terms of um, how it penetrates what I can say is that we did some uh, some side work that I couldn't present today where we took pictures of the Brett as it's penetrating they do form some really weird structures pseudo hyphae that look like little fingers. They're much smaller than a viable cell, but you can see these pseudo hyphae, and, I, and we're wondering if that's one of, the, one of the mechanisms by which the yeast is able to penetrate. Certainly through the movement of ethanol and water through that stave, that's gonna act as capillary action, but we think the pseudo, uh, the pseudo hyphae are also part of, the, uh, of its quote unquote mobility. Hi, um, you mentioned steaming and 12 minutes, but post steaming, what is your recommendation for storage of empty barrels? What do you currently do? <laughs> I'm available. Um, you know, I, I know everybody has their own idea on how to do that, SO2 gassing and putting a little uh, Dixie cup on the top uh, is, is common. And, and certainly that, that would be something to consider. You got to be, just be careful and understand that Brett can penetrate and you got to make sure that you're getting it uh, or else you're going to get an infection again when you refill that barrel. That's the, that's the concern. Uh, my question is fluorescence microscopy. Um, what are you using for like the stain? Is that possible if you have a phase contrast microscope to, to use something like that? No. No. Yeah, you, yeah, you've got to have the fluorescence. Uh, we use uh, C, uh, CFDA SE for the viability stain. We use propidium iodide for the uh, uh, for the for the the dead stain. You've got to have the fluorescence microscopy. Um, it is a it is a kind of a tricky method to do. I'm not going. We thought at one time that we might be able to use it as a, as a QC method, but it's really too involved for that kind of a situation. You, you know, QC, you've got to move faster, and, and it just isn't a method that's conducive to it. Next question, please. <laughs> I know there's somebody over here to ask a question. As far as I'm aware, nobody has specifically looked at it yet. I think it has potential, though. But I have no, heard of nobody looking at it. really sure it's it's interesting a current work we're doing um, timing of infection after EML and we're, so we're we're delaying like we put the wine through EML and then we're delaying when the infection happens and to see uh, kind of how long this might happen and, and we're seeing a similar <coughs> thing as with the live and the dead is the some strain differences with strains that stay viable or culturable for longer uh, once they die down we see Brett come up others that that die off a little earlier, they go down, Brent goes up. Um, we're not, sh I mean, whether it's a response 
there's other, other work has been done in other areas on cell to cell contact, quorum sensing, things like that. We really don't know if that's, if that's exactly is what's going on. We'd be interested to look at the, we've just been doing culturable cells to look at whether we see this similar response like with the SO2, whether they're still there, but not culturable. Um, we don't know whether that is what's happening or not. They certainly come back eventually, but it might take 100, 200 days. Um, it's got, seems to have a similar response to sometimes what we see with other kind of barriers to Brett's growth, but. You think that interaction is, is static or cyclic? I don't know. I don't know at this point, yeah. 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 We know if we put them in at the same time, at the same point in the media, that we don't see that at the same population. I mean, we're inoculating about 10 to the 3 cells of Brett into a wine that has about 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 7 enococcus. If we put them in at the same high rate, we don't see that same. Um, with, in media, we see a little bit of drop, and then it, it, it grows just fine. So I think there's also some population um, things going on there as well, where we have to have this this difference there. What's well, really interesting with the filtration and the lack of the effect, but there's some interesting questions. Yeah, there is. We out of time? Unless there's one last question. Yeah. Time for one last question. All right, well, um, if you have any other questions, Charlie and I hang out here for a little bit longer, but otherwise I think we're on to lunch. So thank you for attending the session. And